Hi, and welcome to the Planet Driven Brands podcast. In this show, we will be discussing with our guests how brands they represent can help in the drive to build a better, more sustainable and safer planet. We will highlight brands as drivers for change and the role they play as influencers. How will brands positively impact the planet and its environment? This is what we're going to find out. Do brands actually have any responsibility to change? The Planet Driven Brands podcast, episode 25. Today's guest is Andrew Ely. We're going to be talking about the plant-based food industry. Hi, Andrew. Really, really great of you to come on our show. I wonder if you could give us a quick introduction. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, no, it's good, good to be here. Um, so, Andrew Ely, I've been working in plant protein pretty seriously now for what, four, four or five years and uh, just blown away by the, the whole movement, really. I mean, I came into it, ironically, around the family dinner table. So I've got two kids, Matthew and Jessica, and um, they started talking about eating less meat and global warming, climate change, what was happening. Uh, And like all good families, we try on good days to be a bit of a democracy. And Mm -hmm. that one way or another led to just having a real serious look at what was happening in plant protein. So I'm really interested in the history of plant-based food. You go back further in it than I do. And I just wondered if if you could give us your thoughts on where this booming movement came from. It's a it's a complex answer. You know, I, I think yes. the first of all, you'd have to make a point about ideology and the vegan society and the vegetarian movement, which were a lot of people who really believed in a better way forward. That wasn't, however, where I started. I have to be honest with you. I started in the food industry and my passion has always been about food that tasted great. Yeah. And when I came on board with plant protein, my eureka moment, if you like, which was with a, a lovely little Finnish company called Golden Green, was realizing that you could combine the ideology with food that tasted great. And that's when I said, yeah, this this one's for me. And mm. I, uh, I, I, I tasted that product, first of all, in Sweden. And I'm not so, you know, there are lots of great tasting products coming to market, but that was the one that was the light bulb moment for me. And, and that was back in, well, I guess 2016 now. So it was, it was, mm. it was just, just before the, the real gold rush, if you like. And I, was, I guess you do have to call it a gold rush at the moment. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, you think the January was pretty much launching at the same time and people, people were still seeing vegan, the dogma and the ideology. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, it, it had become off putting. We need also to remember, I mean, the, the conspicuous consumption was, I think the plant milks were perhaps the forerunner to the plant meats, if you like. You know, they, they never forget the element of fashion in food trends. We know about the fashion market, but food has fashions as well. And mm-hmm. I think that was a whole part of, yes, it was ideology, but it was linked to fashion. And, and as I said, in my previous answer, stuff that tasted great as well. Yeah. So it was, it was all of those things coming together, really. Dare I say we're in a, a post-vegan world now where actually vegan is just a label, really, that helps people understand what's in the food they're buying? Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot recently about exactly that phrase, post-vegan, and what does it mean? Because I think, you know, the, the first couple of years, so I suppose 2017, 2018, this thing was really taking off. You know, you knew it was taking off. I knew it was taking off. There were still a lot of naysayers who said, you know, this this is a flash in the pan. This is a year or two, and then everyone's going to go back to, you know, to eating meat every day. It's clearly it's normalised, but it's got responsibility now in a way. And and I think as the sector grows up, it gets more mainstream. Mm-hmm. And there are responsibilities that come with being mainstream. You, sometimes you have to start working a bit harder. You know, I think we'll start seeing, you know, the vast proliferation of products when the merchandisers do their work and the range planners. Some of those wonderful new products that came in will start coming out. I think post-vegan is, and by post-vegan, we mean it's established. It's going to carry on getting bigger, carry on growing. But there will be new responsibilities and, and lots of work still to be done. You know, I think that's yeah. that's the other point, isn't it? We, we can't pause to take breath. We need to keep mm. going with this. And, and we will, you know, for sure. This market is now getting to a mature, not fully mature state, but a mature enough state to be able to be not for being too processed. It just shows a sign that, that as you just said, products are just going to disappear as a result. Yeah, I think, you know, the market is maturing. 
it's, it's an adolescent market now, isn't it? So it's going to mm. do some great stuff. There's going to be some flaky stuff happening as well. One of the things about developing markets, we never quite know exactly where the opportunities are or where the minefields are. And I really and truly hopefully believe that the meat industry embrace and get their mind around what they're doing. I think I think they will. You know, I, th- I think we all want to see the back of factory farming. You know, I mm. think uh, in, I don't know many, how many years, hopefully not too many people are talking about, you know, that was the way we used to treat animals. We don't do that anymore because it yeah. was inhumane. You're right. The movement isn't really anti-meat. It's anti the terrible way to treat animals. Yeah, and I, I think for me, and as part of the way I've always done business, it has to be about positive choices. And and of course, we know, you know, we're not naive. We know in life people make positive, so they make choices for positive reasons and for negative reasons. But for me, adopting new food patterns has to be about positive reasons. Mm-hmm. It has to be about great food. Um, you know, I think what some of the fast food chains have done and are doing to, is 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 amazing. It's wonderful to see. I think that that that's good. I think the supermarkets, most of them, have done a done a great job. I mean, we we love we love veganuary, so we've done veganuary every year, and I think it's a great you know mind focuser and a little bit of a challenge, not too much of a challenge, which we all love as human beings. But one of the things we've noticed year in year out, you know, breakfast great, dinner great. Hang on a minute. What is there for lunch? Now there are more lunch products coming on the market, but I still think there's a gap for you know cheese. We've talked about privately, haven't we? Those vegan cheese, I think, still a little bit of work to be done on cheeses. There are still so many gaps in the market. You know, one of my personal hobby horses is protein content. So if we're selling something as a, a substitute for a nutritious protein, which you know that's what meat is, it is a nutritious protein. We need to make sure the substitute we're selling has has a decent level of protein in. You know, if we're doing a good job as an industry, and for my money, there's still too, far too many products where the protein level is just, you know, I guess you could say derisory at best. So I think I think that the nascent sector that is yeah. meat replacement have, you know, they have res- they have some opportunity, but they have a lot of responsibility as well. Vegetables taste good if you cook them right. Same with any food. We, I mean, we talk a lot about flavour. I, th- I think you know, meat is about taste and texture. And I think one of the one of the detail breakthroughs on meat replacements was was about understanding that texture point. You know, the, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of soy soy product, but a lot of this soy protein has been around probably for fifty years. I mean, I, I remember mm-hmm. TVP textured vegetable protein when I was a kid. Hated the stuff, incidentally. So, but the difference between a soy TVP and, uh, you know, Oomph is another brand I like, a, a lovely Swedish brand. The, the difference yes. between TVP and Oomph is, that you, you know, you'd never guess it was made from the, but it, yeah. that, it's about texture, isn't it? So it's. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of clever proteins out there now. You've got pea and seitan, tempeh, tofu, all kinds of different don't, ways. Don't forget oats, of course. And of course, oats. Sorry, yeah. Green and Gold. So, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, but if you look at the drink sector, oats have taken over. Yeah, I mean, the, the point, but just to give a little plug for oats, of course, is grow well in northern latitudes. Yes. And let's forget, or let's remember, you know, we're talking about climate change. We're, we're trying to reduce the food miles. So we, we got a product that goes well in the northern latitudes and is is great for making meat and milk replacements, as you say. I mean, yeah, mm. for sure, they, that... No, I, th- I think there's, you know, there's a lot of work to be done with those protein sources. I think that's re- is really interesting and exciting to see, see what. I mean, and it is, it is one of those sectors that we were talking about this earlier. Well, it's exciting to work on, you know, and it, it, I think mean, almost guarantees progress, doesn't it? And what about retail? Do you think they're they're ahead, or are they still playing catch up? I haven't really worked out how to merchandise and and, and where where how to categorize it. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's an interesting question, isn't it? I, 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 you know, because for all the talk of merchandising it with meat, by and large, you, you've had a, you know, there's a meat replacement fixture, which is a mix of both primary products, so stuff you need to cook, and also processed, i.e., ready meals. Uh, I guess the answer is probably that the merchandising for meat replacements will have to evolve in its its own way. You know, it's very, when we've done consumer research, raw meat doesn't look attractive. However, when consumers buy meat replacements, they do expect it to look attractive. And if, you know, if you sit in a focus group and say, well, hang on a minute, you're happy to buy meat that doesn't, you know, that looks in a particular way, your expectations are higher from meat replacements. Consumers get one of these sort of slight, you know, do not, 
you know, they're being inconsistent and they know they are, but it's their right to be inconsistent, isn't it? You know, they're choosing what to buy. Mm. So I, um, you know, I, I, I mean, we have to be really happy with the, if we look back over five years, probably the space for meat replacements has tripled. So I, th- I think we have to be pretty happy with, with progress. I, I think we, as a sector, just have to make sure all of, all of the products in that space is really earning its keep. I, you know, I think that's, mm. that is a manufacturer responsibility as opposed to a retailer responsibility, isn't it? You know what your consumers are looking for and why they're buying it. All those basic disciplines, you know, they still apply to this sector. It's very true, and it comes back yet again. It's got to taste good, and, and like you say, Wicked Kitchen did an amazing job because actually, it was great tasting food that happens to be vegan, led by a passionate, passionate vegan, admittedly, um, in Derek Sarno. I, I agree with everything you've said about Wicked Kitchen. The other thing I loved about it is they really got the branding spot on, and yeah. Wicked Kitchen to me was like, you know, that's a return to form. That's you really you've got the right people doing the right thing the branding's great the pricing's right it was a real it was a bullseye you know back of the net thank you so much i it's a passion of mine the plant-based food industry and you you've been incredibly enlightening thank you yeah good all right nick have a good one take care of yourself see you cheers all the best bye-bye bye thank you ever so much thank you for listening we hope you enjoyed the show The Planet Driven Brands podcast is the brainchild and copyright of Nick Jones and is broadcast in partnership with theplanetsagency.com. Planets Agency is a partnership of consultants and communications experts who build planet-driven brands. During the series of shows, we'll be hearing from more experts and we would love for you to be involved. Please do comment or come back to us with questions. We'll be happy to engage. If you wish to be notified when our episodes are broadcast, please subscribe on the website. If you'd like to be part of the show, we'd love to hear from you. We look forward to many more entertaining episodes. Thanks again for listening.